And we're now um, live. So today is Tuesday, November 10, 2020. And welcome everybody to our Liquidity Project Financial Market Infrastructure event. Um, we are excited to welcome Robert Steigerwald, um, Perry Merling, and then Ori to this uh, conversation. So um, this is um, a panel discussion that has been put together by the Liquidity Project Financial Market Infrastructure. Thank you for um, everybody for, for coming online. As the name says, um, the um, liquidity project financial market infrastructure, its goal is to make everybody who make researchers aware um, of the need of um, research in, in financial market infrastructure. And we sort of carve that specific angle on uh, liquidity problems out for ourselves. Um, we have had multiple introductions about LPFMI and who we are and what we do. So I'm not going to go into depth in here just in the interest of time. I am um, just going to say that today for us is our flagship event when it comes to the plenary, as we think uh, that this conversation might be a good entry for you interested into this topic by uh, this distinguished panel of ours today. Um, I just want to highlight that we had on uh, Monday last week, that was uh, Monday 2nd, um, an introduction by two uh, young scholars of ours on CCPs and on the money view. And uh, if this sort of entices you, this, if you find this conversation interesting, maybe you go back to this, um, to this um, recording and get yourself um, on to speed on this. Um, this might be interesting. For those of you who have been part of this or know what uh, the money view is or what CCPs are or what LPFMI is about. Um, and this Friday, we're going to have a um, three of our researchers presenting their work. Um, so this a bit more for advanced scholars. Among them will be actually Basel, who's also co-moderating uh, uh, tonight, but also Naomi Alvarez from the Chicago Fed and uh, Christoph Becker from, um, from Darmstadt University. Um, having said that all, I'm going to now quickly introduce the panel, um, then maybe um, Basel, you can introduce yourself. I'm going to say a few words about myself, and then we're going to kick it into uh, the questions. So um, we have aligned among the panelists that we're going to keep it very short on the introduction. So Robert Steigerwald is a, a senior policy advisor at the Chicago Fed uh, currently. Um, Perry Merling is a professor at Boston University and is known as an uh, academic advisor to um, INET. And uh, Dan Ori is a, uh, a law professor at Cornell University. And all three of them are senior scholars um, at the LPFMI and sort of uh, interacting with us on this topic. Um, Basel, hand it over to you quickly. Um, you are, you, you're still on mute, Basel. Thanks, Kiko. Um, uh, briefly, uh, Jan Basel Sansom, I'm, I'm an economist um, and postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Warwick, um, where my research is uh, uh, around structural sources of stability and instability in complex systems, including financial networks, and um, uh, I have an interest in sort of CCP interconnectedness and systemic risk. And um... My name is Gerhard Kolderhaberg, everybody, I go by the name by Kiko, and I am here at LPFMI, sort of one of the um, um, persons in driving this uh, LPFMI forward. So um, let's get this going. Um, we, what, we, what we thought might be a good kickoff is just to ask everybody of you to um, tell us um, and let everyone know why are you interested in, in derivatives clearing? Um, tell us about your motivation behind this. And maybe Robert, we can start with you. And perhaps um, Kiko, just in case it's not quite the same thing, uh, maybe why young scholars in the room today ought to be interested as well. Mm -hmm. Th thank you for that intervention, Basil. I, th I think that will be much more interesting to the audience. Uh, and I, I'm inclined to say that my interest in derivatives clearing is just a reflection of the limitations of my social life. Uh, you know, I just uh, am fascinated by this very arcane area of the financial world. Uh, but the more important question is the one that Basil uh, poses. Uh, and, and for me, uh, 
financial market infrastructure broadly to include the payment system, securities depositories, central uh, counterparty clearinghouses and such are some of the most interesting uh, financial institutions that I'm familiar with. Uh, I guess I would try to put a, a little bit more uh, meat on that by saying that uh, both lawyers and philosophers and, of course, economists are interested in the problems of contracting. Uh, and for uh, th there is an important intersection or uh, relationship between contract as such and bankruptcy, which really tests the outer limits of our ability to make forward commitments and carry them out. Uh, clearing uh, can be interpreted as a kind of uh, internalization or privatization of some aspects of bankruptcy. Uh, and so uh, I find a very rich set of intellectual uh, questions that relate to the boundaries uh, and continuities for that matter. Uh, among contract, bankruptcy, social policy, uh, economic policy and such. Before I carry on any further and just to get it out of the way, I am obliged to make a standard disclaimer that uh, my remarks today are solely my own and not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago or the Board of Governors. Good. We're done with that. So that's my answer to, to the introductory question. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Perry, can we um, move it maybe over to you? Um, sure. The, uh... You know, I I come from a different from the top down. I suppose um, I'm interested in the in derivatives clearing because I have come to see that market based credit shadow banking it seems to be the marginal source of credit in the modern economy. And for that, there's very to, to make money market funding of capital market lending work. There's a lot of credit enhancement that is that that is involved using derivatives typically. So I think that derivative, particularly interest rate swaps. Um, but also credit default swaps in the last in the last financial crisis, um, and for exchange swaps now, since so much funding is being done in a different currency, um, so that to make this modern banking system work requires derivatives, and and in fact the prices of capital come from the prices of derivatives. So that the price formation in the dealer markets for derivatives um, is, is a critical part basically of, of, the, of the modern system. So although it does fascinate the nerd in me, um, the, uh, it also is, it seems to me, the very, very core of, of, the, modern, of the modern system. Something that is not well understood, um, partly because People don't understand that shadow banking is at the core. You know, the, a lot of the things I just said are are controversial points. Okay, but it, but you asked where I'm coming from, and anyone who's coming from a money view framework will immediately see why see, you know follow all of that. But if you haven't been introduced to that, that may seem like gibberish. So um, I I apologize for that. But there is a MOOC for you. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Dan. Would you? Uh, can you talk about sure. a little bit of Thanks. So from my perspective, coming from a background as a lawyer, uh, financial market infrastructure in general, but also derivatives and clearing, are this really interesting uh, confluence of contract, property, uh, governance rights in ways that create interesting and important institutional setups where the design of those institutions matters a lot. Um, uh, and so for a lawyer, especially a private law lawyer, uh, looking to understand institutional design in ways that has huge public um, implications, uh, really it's hard to, hard to argue against um, derivatives clearing as um, a, a wonderful and really bottomless case study. Excellent. So, um... For those of you who are not aware of this, um, in um, 2009, the G20 uh, came together in Pittsburgh, United States, to discuss and also that mandate changes to the financial system, to uh, regulation, and what at the time was intended or is intended to make financial crises such as the one in 2007 and 2008 uh, less likely to happen again. And one of the key uh, reforms that they had decided upon then was uh, the clearing mandate. And maybe we can post this following question to all of you as well, that um, 
in your view, um, has central clearing, how has central clearing affected systemic risk and through what mechanisms? And maybe we'll start with, um, I'm just thinking what makes it most interesting. Maybe we'll start the other way around. Maybe Dan, we can start with you and then work our way back. Sure. So I, I'm personally, I'm really waiting to hear what Rob has to say. Exactly. Uh, I thought the best at the end. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to come up with some wild speculation and then uh, uh, Rob can tell me why I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, as you might be able to tell, I don't really know the answer to that question. Uh, and I think that's telling in itself as somebody who um, uh, keeps on top of these sort of things. The information that we have um, in the public domain gives us some basic proxies for how structure and risk profiles are changing. Uh, the BIS just came up with some data uh, from a few months ago on the, uh, the gross uh, market and credit exposures uh, within um, not the centrally cleared space, but uh, the OTC space. Uh, it's difficult to tell where these risks are going to reside, how they may have shifted from prior to the the, the Dodd-Frank and EMEA reforms until we actually get the right kind of stress scenario uh, that uncovers them, um, at least from the outside. Um, and so uh, all we can really do with, uh, all we can really do is hypothesize. So what would the hypotheses be about where some of these risks um, exist? So one of them uh, would clearly be that uh, as a result of uh, the post-crisis reforms, there's a concentration of systemic risk within clearinghouses, and that as a result of that, clearinghouses may become nodes for systemic risk. Um, so if the, uh, the risk management and uh, loss absorption architecture does not work, um, risk goes out from the clearinghouse. Obviously, that hasn't happened yet, but we may have not had the right type of scenario for that to happen yet. Uh, another hypothesis is that um, by forcing uh, derivatives activity into clearing houses um, and given the, uh, the economies of scale associated with market making uh, is that we may have created stronger economic links uh, between major clearing members and clearing houses such that the failure of major clearing houses or more than one major or clearing members, more than one major clearing members could have an impact on the stability uh, of the clearinghouse. Again, it's difficult to tell what the interplay is there. Adding to that complexity is the fact that when you get it uh, down to brass tacks and a lot of large clearing members do a wide range of other financial activities other than derivatives and derivatives uh, clearing, uh, it becomes difficult and, um, well, I suppose uh, uh, important uh, to try to map out where those risks uh, might reside. Those sort of um, uh, those sort of are the two big uh, uh, possibilities here. Uh, I'm going to leave it to uh, uh, to Rob, hopefully, maybe to shed some light on that. Although now I feel as though I'm putting all sorts of pressure on Rob to to answer those questions when it really is difficult to uh, uh, assess. Uh, but that's effectively what we're looking for. Um, uh, and um, I think the bigger question uh, that we should all be asking in terms of research projects is, are we collecting the right information to begin asking these questions? Uh, and then are we subjecting that information to the scrutiny necessary to try to anticipate uh, when and where some of these risks might arise? Barry? Um, so in the in the questions you sent beforehand, this question began with, is the CCP a silver bullet? Um, and so I had a nice sharp answer for that. No, okay. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't ask it that way. I didn't I stick thought, to the script, that's you true. You didn't stick to the script. The, um, so let me uh, back up a little bit. And, and, and uh, it's good that you framed this by saying in, in 2009, such and such happened and they uh, created this. Um, Remember that the goal was basically to make sure that trouble in derivatives wouldn't wouldn't come back to the taxpayer. Okay, that was that was the objective, and they weren't really thinking about developing a well-functioning liquidity financial infrastructure. They were just saying 
there's this stuff sitting on the balance sheet of banks, okay? And banks are specifically privileged in access to all kinds of things, you know, because of deposit insurance and, and the discount window with the Fed. We want them, we want this stuff not to get in through the, through, we don't want to use the fact that this stuff is on the balance sheet of, the, of, of these banks to mean that somehow we've extended the safety net. We want to push it somewhere else. And so they did, and they pushed it and they broke it into two pieces. I think that's important to realize too, that they they took the matched book dealing part, which was most of it actually, um, and they put it in the CCPs. Okay, that was, and then they took the speculative book stuff and gave it over to hedge funds and 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 other and other folks. Okay, so those are the those are the locations of activity that used to take place um, in 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 dealer markets. Now this is very important to appreciate because when it was on the balance sheet of Credit Suisse or something like that, you know, they are thinking about who their counterparties are. And they're saying, my counterparty is another bank, here's, and I'm controlling that, that, and my counterparty is a client, I'm controlling that, I know what they're doing. Um, and they're worried about their own exposure to risk through those channels, okay? Now they're being forced to have an exposure to this CCP, which is a black box of a kind. It's because you don't, there's a lot of other people, members of this thing that I don't have separate agreements with, okay? And they also have all these clients who are doing who knows how many crazy things that I don't even have a window into. And so this is probably not what the banks would have designed. And maybe it's not the, the thing that we're going to get when we keep evolving this system. But it was not meant to do that. It was meant to take the risk off the balance sheet of the banks. And it basically did, although I think we're going to hear how some of it in, in a crisis, the members are called upon um, and, we're, and we're going to see that. But I think that's important to appreciate that that it uh, that the systemic risk has not gone away; it's just moved to a different location. Now, it does mean that the CC, it's concentrated in the CCP, and the CCP now, the Fed and the government can decide: should we help the CCP? Should we not help the CCP? It's not automatic through the banks, or they can figure out what kind of pipes they want to build. So that's what's going on right now. Um, but it is it is definitely a work in progress. It is not a silver bullet. Thank you. Well, I hope uh, that has now sort of, um, you know, the, the drums were, it's, uh, were rolling. Robert, could we, uh, could, we, could we get you into the conversation? Absolutely. On that. Fortunately, I'm in complete agreement with all that Dan and Perry have said so far. So that, that, that spares me the burden of uh, introducing anything terribly new. Uh, I completely agree with Dan's observation that, that we have not yet experienced uh, uh, the kind of stress scenario that will test uh, the new architecture. And, and uh, as well, I'm completely in agreement with Perry's uh, observation that CCPs are not silver bullets uh, and, and that there were political motivations that uh, underpin the decisions taken in Pittsburgh in 2009 uh, that, that do not arise to a full uh, architectural reworking of infrastructure supporting modern derivatives markets. Um, I, I'm tempted to be a bit cheeky and with apologies uh, to Samuel Beckett say that, that we are awaiting not Godot, uh, but awaiting what, what I sometimes refer to as our new budget. Uh, for me, I hope this will have some resonance be because of who you are in this, in this community. Uh, for me, budget represents a crystallization of ideas about the operation of the financial system and the role of the central bank uh, in that system uh, that took place at a, at a critical time. Uh, but, it, but it was narrowly restricted, given the circumstances of the time, to thinking about the banking system. Uh, now we have these non-bank uh, market infrastructures that are so terribly important and integrated with the banking system for all the reasons that Dan and Perry have suggested. And yet we don't yet have a, uh, a political consensus uh, or even a, a well-defined operational understanding of how the central bank should interact with these new mechanisms. Uh, I can uh, tell you it's anathema in the United States to talk about um, ordinary routine liquidity provision by the central bank to, to a CCP. 
uh, and even the extraordinary powers that are now embedded in the Dodd-Frank Act are, are hedged about with all kinds of uh, legalistic restrictions. Um, so for me, the emphasis on central clearing reflects a continued evolution of market infrastructure, which uh, has tended over the last 50 or, or more years to uh, devise ways, to implement ways, to contain credit risk uh, through employing delivery versus payment for securities, payment versus payment for FX, uh, collateralization of various sorts, all of which culminates in uh, a, an environment that is heavily dependent upon liquidity and not just liquidity in an aggregate sense, but time specific, time critical uh, liquidity that has to be in the right currency at the right time, at the right place. Uh, so for, from my perspective, what we have done is to transform credit risk into liquidity and operational risk. And we have not yet uh, dealt with uh, the, uh, the, the actual uh, operational mechanics uh, or the political uh, will necessary to have the ultimate provider of liquidity play a useful role in, in this new environment. Um, so you, you will know, if you know my work, you will hear some themes that, that I've discussed before. I'll, I'll stop there and perhaps we'll, we'll come back to them in the course of the conversation. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so uh, um, I wonder, uh, Robert, if... Um, we could push push you a little bit more on um, uh, this sort of theme or idea of uh, time critical liquidity and the, the sort of transformation of credit risk uh, 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 into liquidity risk. Um, so, I mean, uh, what's the what's the character of this trade off? Is it a is it a trade off? And if it's a trade off, I mean, can and should we be thinking in terms of some optimization of it? Or, I mean, uh, how? I mean. Uh, I mean, can, can we sort of compare these different sorts of risks? I mean, are they they're sort of qualitatively different or, um, I mean, I don't know, but could, could, could we ask you to elaborate a bit, a bit more on that? It seems like a fascinating, um, fascinating thing. Sure, um, I, I've given some thought to this, but I, I, I can't promise you that I've got meaningful conclusions. I sometimes get myself into trouble with uh, my friends who are, trained as I am not in physics by uh, using the analogy of uh, the second law of thermodynamics and, and, and my physicist friends get very upset. Uh, they, there are all kinds of reasons why that's not perhaps a, a, an apt analogy, but there is some kind of hydraulic relationship or some, some interaction that I don't know how to characterize between these mechanisms that mitigate credit risk and what I see as, as resulting acute uh, vulnerabilities to liquidity and operational failure. Um, I think all I can do besides saying that is, is to point out that uh, there are a variety of mechanisms at play in market infrastructure that have this propensity that I've described as creating time critical liquidity. Uh, and, and they all go back more or less to the Herstadt failure in 1974, which triggered uh, the effort to convert the dominant payment system model of the time, which were uh, multilateral end of day net settlement systems into real time gross settlement systems. Uh, and then beyond that, more recently, more hybrid models of payments uh, to implement delivery versus payment for securities, to in, increase collateralization, to ultimately mandate central clearing. All of these things uh, at their core are designed to mitigate credit risk, but they only operate by imposing tight time frames or collateral requirements uh, that have to be observed or the, 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 the basic objective of, of credit risk mitigation is not served. 
and so, so just to sort of just to clarify, just to clarify, as I understand the, the the point here is that um, this means that that money has to move, payments have to be made, uh, where before you just sort of had accounting uh, movement. Is, is, is that right? Yes, I think that's right, and and I. I... Again, I, I don't claim to have fully explored the, the mysteries of this universe, which is why I'm so interested in the money view and the perspectives that the other participants in this conversation uh, will share with us. Um, but it seems to me that one of the benefits, but also one of the vulnerabilities of this environment is, is, is that the scope for affecting others is much wider than than the more isolated instance of, of a credit failure, perhaps. Okay, you have a hand up there. Yeah, so maybe since, since uh, Robert said the magic word, money view, the um, one, one way of understanding this evolution that Robert's talking about, okay, is that it's an evolution from a, sort of a credit system to a cash system or, or from elasticity to discipline. You know that, and and so the time critical part is a lot of discipline. You know, you and 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 discipline creates an opportunity for things to break. You know, where people can't, they they there there's no flexibility there. There's no elasticity, and so payments can fail. Okay, when when you have more elasticity, basically, okay, I can't pay you now. I'll pay you tomorrow. You know, there's there there's 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 looseness in the system. Um, this, this is by design, but it also, one of the important things that we, that we emphasize in the money view is that the boundary, the balance between discipline and elasticity is a moving target, you know, and it, and it changes with evolution of institutions, it changes over the business cycle, you know, in period, right now, you obviously we're in period of massive elasticity because the central banks are being asked to, to solve a virus problem, you know, and so, okay, what can we do? Well, the one thing we can do is just turn on the turn on the spigots you know but that's not going to be forever you know that's not going to be forever and then there's going to be and and the more or less this you have now the harder the discipline is going to be when you get it you know but there but that's just another example for those of you who are starting to use this language um robert speaking about you know the the, the herstadt example was elasticity multilateral clearing end of day there's a lot of credit expansion during the day and then it's supposed to all collapse down at the end of the, and if it doesn't as it didn't, then you have a problem, then you have a problem. So now the reaction to that was maybe excessive discipline. We'll see, uh, you know, but that's, that's I think a way to, to see what the general point is, that it's not just about just specific to this issue, but it's a general point for all uh, financial market infrastructure, finding that balance between uh, necessary elasticity and necessary discipline. You can have too much on either side. That's the trade-off. Basil, if I can just add to that, just Please, very yeah. quickly. Uh, this completely, both conversations completely accord with the lawyer's view of what is happening and when. Uh, when we're talking about intraday balance sheet expansion, crediting and debiting uh, on a single balance sheet, a clearinghouse's balance sheet, a payment systems balance sheet, uh, no legal property has been transferred in a sense. Uh, but no immediately realizable, immediately executable contracts have been uh, either honored or violated. Once we move to uh, this time critical liquidity component, not only does the failure to post variation margin within very tight timeframes become something that is a contractual and broader governance default, is that those contractual and governance defaults may be cross-linked uh, to other triggers under other contracts that then create this web of um, fragility in effect uh, that can create, um, that, that maps on I think fairly well to the idea of um, either having some sort of uh, elasticity in the system or some sort of hardwired rigidity that then when it works, it's great. But when something is rigid breaks, uh, it's very difficult to fix. Uh, and that's, um, uh, I think, part of the point that uh, both Perry and Robert Ray are making. Um, Perry, um, would, um, would, uh, would Perry Merling say that, uh, that um, sort of discipline in, in, in sort of some parts of the system potentially uh, sort of pushes the demand for, uh, for elasticity uh, 
sort of into some other part of the system. Uh, um, well, the, the stated at that level of abstraction, I'm not sure, but <laughs> but let me uh, let me take that in the direction that Dan Ari was pushing it. You know, which is which is this fragility aspect. You know, that if you if you get all hung up about oh we have to have you know get rid of all the credit risk, everything has to be collateralized, it all has to be time critical. You're creating a fragile system, and so that when it breaks, basically it just drops onto the balance sheet of the Fed. Okay, the elasticity is so lender of last resort becomes lender of first resort. There's nothing. There's no. There's no elasticity to absorb a shock. Okay, and so it just breaks, and then it drops onto the balance sheet of the Fed. So you haven't actually sort of prevented collapse. You've actually created a, a system that is more vulnerable to collapse, conceivably, um, by trying to get rid of of the things that you saw as as adding in as as involving credit risk. Well, sure, but let me revert to my first comments. When this thing, when this operation was being run by the bankers themselves, right? They were they were deciding. Who am I willing to engage with on a credit basis? You know, because we do thousands of trades a day, and we are just going to keep track of them. And at the end of the day, we'll see who's who's ahead and who needs to. And 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 we're in business together all the time. And who doesn't get credit for me? You know, and has to and has to pay cash on the on the barrel head. So and and every variation in between. Okay, so individual members were were deciding. And changing over time, you know, when do I, when am I willing to basically keep an open line with this person, and when, and and with whom, and and not? Okay, now we're trying to sort of rationalize the system and make it sort of flat. It it wants to be hierarchical like that, you know. It, it wants for there to be different rules for different people. Um, in, that's part of the way you get that balance between discipline and elasticity, just because everyone wants elasticity for me and discipline for you, right? But, but that, that's not gonna work. So you, you, it, you, there, there's, there's a balance and it's, and it's in the details. So it's not a matter of let's get the, the right set of rules and then apply them across the board. I think, that, I think you'll find that that won't that won't that won't give you the balance that you that you that you want, um, and also the right set of rules and let them and and then never change them. That also is not going to give you it's not going to give you what you want because once you understand that the problem is is managing this balance, you're you you're, at least you're on the right track in thinking about what kind of institutions. And I'm very interested in what you say, Dan, about about the law that there are these things on balance sheets that aren't contracts. <laughs> You know, intraday. Um, there are promises to pay at the end of the day, from my point of view, from a money view, because that's what they are. They're, but they're not con they're not enforceable contracts, I guess, in in a in a legal sense. Um, and that is elasticity. That's a fuzzy little area there that you that you need in order to make the payment system work. Because the payment system is a credit system. That's why Bitcoin can't work. You know, because there's you, you you credit is not a bug. It's a feature. Of a, of a payment system um, and trying to get rid of it for safety's sake is killing is killing what you're trying to save. So before we continue, um, um, maybe with the next question to Dan, I, I just wanna for everybody's sake who um, you are not in this conversation all the time, maybe just take up a few points and clarify them and maybe haven't had a chance to be in the introduction uh, Monday last week that I think what Perry and that Dan have been discussing is, um, in in my view, this uh, this between discipline and elasticity. I think Dan was alluding how everything is interconnected, and once you have a problem at one spot, it can flow to many other areas within the financial system. And so, if you have a concentration point like CCPs, so it matters what is going on at CCPs. And I think the key point I want to make aware for those of you who are not aware of this that. Well, whilst earlier times, JP Morgan and Bank of America had a contractual relationship, if one couldn't pay, then they could sort of negotiate. And I think that's alluding to the elasticity that Perry and the money view is talking about. But the one key fact about CCPs is that now that you have a CCP in between, that relationship gets broken up. Now JP Morgan has a relationship with the CCP and the Bank of America has a relationship with the CCP. And if one cannot pay, that's a problem because they have to pay. That is just the nature of the legal 
um, uh, of the legal environment that they're now in. And that's sort of the discipline, I think, that Perry was uh, talking about. Um, and I um, want to make a little plug-in on this um, that really leads to this time-critical liquidity that Robert has been talking about and that Basel and I have um, uh, um, talked about that we want to get him to talk more about. There's a paper by um, him and uh, David Marshall that we would recommend reading on that, that sort of gives a fascination, a window into, in, uh, into all of that that we, I think we have been discussing so far. So, oh, yeah, so Kiko, sorry. Let me, let me just, just add on to that, just since yes, you're that was just very plain, we're very easy. We're translating yeah. between frameworks. Time critical liquidity for the money view is, 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 is what we're talking about with the settlement constraint, mm -hmm. sometimes called the survival constraint, you know, which, which, is, which is a way of saying critical, right? <laughs> um, survival is critical. Um, so it, it is about that, it's, it, it's settlement. So these concepts which, have, which appear in different places um, in our intellectual frameworks actually map onto each other pretty tightly. You know, in, in, in Chicago a year ago, Robert and I spent two hours in a Starbucks and discovered that basically these things sort of, they line up, they, they, map, they map together. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm just, for those of you who know one side or the other side, I'm helping to do that translation here. Um, uh, maybe, yep. Would I just jump, jump in very quickly because uh, yeah. I, th I think this is the right time to uh, mention how nicely the points Perry has just made uh, map into some current circumstances I think we should take note of. So, so uh, up to this point, I've talked uh, about this progression from credit risk mitigation to accentuating liquidity and operational concerns, but that process can work in reverse as well. So guess what? The policymakers now having mandated central querying realize that they really own the consequences that will follow. And what are they doing? They're trying to reverse engineer CCPs. They're concerned about pro-cyclicality. Well, pro-cyclicality is part of the DNA of the CCP for all the reasons we've just been discussing. Uh, it's the, the private sector objective of the CCP is to assure the continuity of contract. It is to enforce contract performance. And it has a propensity to uh, reduce overall risk, but under extreme circumstances, it can, as we have observed, accentuate systemic risks. The private sector point of view is systemic risk be damned. We're here to enforce contracts, but now that policymakers have mandated clearing, they are starting to uh, propose uh, regulations such as capped intraday mark-to-market margin calls to avoid pro-cyclical effects. What does that do? That converts liquidity risk back into credit risk. So this, this, this trade-off that we've identified between discipline and elasticity can, can work both in one direction and, and uh, another. Great, now we have you on the record a little bit on this um, time critical liquidity, um, but maybe we'll put this over to, yep. I was just thinking uh, maybe it'd be good, maybe good to uh, say, uh, so participants, you know, anybody who has questions, uh, would it be a good idea for them to post them in the in the chat section? Um, we will make time uh, um, to 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 look at those questions um, later in the session. Yep, in about twenty minutes, maybe or so. We start ten minutes late. Um, maybe we can um, push uh, uh, put the conversation um, for a moment away from uh, the CCPs and put them though on the derivatives. And um, Dan, put that over to you. The question you had uh, previously stated that sort of quote unquote the regulatory treatment of derivatives as securities and the resulting emphasis on market transparency is somewhat misguided and serves to distract attention from the significant potential risks posed by the widespread use of derivatives quote ending. You've done um, a lot of thinking on derivatives and, and, and what role they play in the financial system. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on that and the statement? Sure. And this statement has probably gotten me into more trouble than I think any that I've ever made. Um, and to understand it, um, it's really understanding what I said immediately after that. 
Um, and it's not that I think that regulators were somehow um, not fully aware of the prudential risks associated with derivatives. But as Perry said earlier, during the crisis and the policy response, especially the first stage, we were grabbing stuff off the shelf and not always asking ourselves whether we were grabbing the right thing off the shelf, whether we needed to come up with new frameworks, new tools for understanding what was happening. And really the point that I'm making there is, um, Rob's mentioned this a couple of times as well, and if you've spent time in derivatives, you know this, is that there's a fundamental distinction between market risk and counterparty credit risk. The, the risk that the underlying um, uh, price is gonna fluctuate over the term of the contract and the risk that your contractual counterparty is gonna default. If you look at Dodd-Frank, and remember that Dodd-Frank is being crafted by uh, staffers, um, but also with the view ultimately that it's gonna be the Commodities Futures Trading Commission and the Securities and Exchange Commission that are responsible for implementing most of it. Um, you realize that they were coming from an existing perspective about how to do things they were good at, uh, at least in theory good at. The SEC, uh, good at making sure that uh, uh, information about uh, price is disclosed, right? The basic sort of thrust of the 34 Act is to make sure that for publicly traded uh, companies, that information about price and volume and uh, bid ask spreads finds its way to a cross section of the public beyond the transacting parties. CFTC similarly, um, especially after 2000, uh, when we get the Commodity Futures Modernization Act effectively preventing it from regulating OTC derivatives, they're focused on futures. And there, while counterparty credit risk mattered, it was the same for everybody because everybody's counterparty credit risk is the clearinghouse. And so I have a securities regulator that wants everybody to know about price, volume, bid ask spreads. And I've got an exchange traded, exchange traded futures regulator that wants everybody to know the same things, plus has some knowledge, well, lots of knowledge, to be honest, about how to design clearinghouses. But none of them has any experience, uh, sort of mandated by the CFMA, with OTC derivatives. And so where you end up with the disclosure requirements for OTC derivatives under Dodd-Frank is that there's disclosure of market risk and absolutely no disclosure of counterparty credit risk, not anything that's interesting anyway. And that actually undermines the very objective of securities laws, which is to try to have informative prices. Why aren't prices informative if I don't know anything about counterparty credit risk? because I don't know if any changes in price reflect changes in the underlying or changes in the credit worthiness of the parties to the contract. Uh, and if I don't know that, then my signal presented by price is fuzzy. And that's the essence of uh, what I was saying there. Note, this isn't a huge thing. This is a tiny fix um, uh, in the, the centrally cleared market. Uh, it's not necessary. I just need to know enough about the clearinghouses credit worthiness and that's the same across all contracts, so I don't worry about the heterogeneity. In the bilateral market, what I you know, have long called for is more information about uh, uh, counterparty credit risk profiles uh, as part of uh, the trade record, uh, in effect, so that uh, market participants can distill the informational signal sent by price changes from any uh, disturbances uh, created by changes in counterparty credit risk. And importantly, the place where that information is most valuable to me is in the thick of a crisis. I want to be able to diagnose when spreads are widening because people are no longer trusting their counterparties versus where spreads are widening because of price volatility. So that's the, that's the essence of that. Uh, a pretty minor fix, uh, ultimately. Um, but the statement is really one where uh, in the din of the crisis, I think we put sometimes the wrong hat on uh, to design the relevant regulations and what their functions were. Fascinating. Perry? So let me just build on that. Um, I, I learned a lot from that, Dan, I, the, stiff, the SEC and CFTC, but both of them, I would emphasize, are viewing this through the lens of the finance view. You know, they're thinking of risk as, be, as about solvency risk, that I've made a bet and it hasn't worked out, and so I need capital it, a loss absorbing capital 
in order to make that happen. They're not thinking at all about time critical payments or anything like that. Risk from their point of view is, a, is about bankruptcy. It's about solvency. It's not about, I need to make a payment and I don't have enough means of payment. I am solvent, but I am not liquid. That concept is foreign from the finance view and also economics view, that it's just inconceivable that you could be solvent and not liquid. And yet that is the essence of the matter when you're thinking about banking, okay? Um, because you have illiquid assets on the one side and liquid liabilities on the other side. Um, and liquidity troubles can make you insolvent because they force fire sales, okay? So, and, and that stuff is now happening in, 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 these, in these derivative clearing issues. So, so that's, the, the, that's a, an overarching sort of frame for understanding what you're saying, Dan, about the different regulators were putting on different hats. They were both finance hats. There were different pieces of the finance hats. And, this, and that helps you also understand why academia also, you know, they're used to thinking of these derivatives, not from a banking point of view, but from like a risk mitigation point of view, a hedge or something like that. They're against some other, some other risk exposure through CAPM or whatever have you, you know, that the notion of risk is, is not this time critical, it's not liquidity risk. And if you have an intellectual framework, which is abstracted from liquidity risk, okay, then every time you see prices move, you say, well, is that credit risk or is that fundamentals? And it never occurs to you, maybe that's a liquidity spread. Maybe that's a liquidity spread that's opening up there. Um, and we're seeing, and so you, you put, the, you put these, these spreads in the wrong analytical boxes and you think you're solving it by dealing with credit. In fact, you're making it worse because you're, it's a, in fact a liquidity spread. So, so we're learning about this system. And the last thing I'll say about that is when we were doing this thing in 2009, I was, I was there, I remember, I wasn't at the table, but I was watching it all. It was very clear that many people uh, who, who were approaching the world from this, from this lens was imagining that shadow banking in particular would just disappear, okay? That because they were understanding shadow banking as really just about leveraged buying of capital assets. They weren't thinking of it as banking. They weren't thinking of it as 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 borrowing as, as like a bank, you know, a liquidity spread of some signs. And and so they hoped it would go away. They didn't know how to regulate it, so they didn't regulate it. They regulated it as if it was something it wasn't. Okay. And so now here we are, ten years later, um, and uh, we're going to have another go at it. I'm sure um, once the COVID the COVID crisis uh, comes to a comes to a stasis, at any rate. Uh, because there were huge liquidity events in this in this crisis in in March 16th, um, and there was a stress test. Okay, and maybe we can hear Robert tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> Robert was unmuting himself. Anyways, maybe Robert. Uh, yeah, I just well, I'm, to trying to, I'm trying to get him to tell us. Yes, yeah. the, 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 because uh, just, just earlier um, Robert said that uh, we haven't yet had you know the stress event that will test these uh, systems. So. Uh, you know, uh, so so perhaps so so as I said, it'd be fantastic to hear about you know how they've worked under the recent stress, but then maybe also if if sort of if this isn't the event to test the systems, then what would that event look like? Sure, um, but before I go there, I do want to pick up on some of what Perry was saying. Uh, there is uh, we are expecting now later this month the Financial Stability Board to finalize guidance on resolution of central counterparties. Uh, and that guidance, in my opinion, is largely based on the kind of uh, uh, framework errors that Perry and Dan have been talking about. So we get not only the market regulators, the SEC and the CFTC and their counterparts globally, but the bank regulators now getting into the mix, uh, interpreting a default driven failure of a CCP as though it's a solvency event, when in fact it is the problem of reestablishing a matched book. It is a portfolio problem. It is a liquidity problem. It is a confidence in contract continuity problem and not necessarily a solvency problem. Of course, you could have more complicated kinds of failures where insolvency accompanies the problem of an unmatched book. Uh, but, but at its core, FSB is trying to use standard bank modeled 
models of resolution to deal with a problem that is quite unlike anything that occurs in banking. So that, that I think nicely ties into what has just been said. Uh, as, as for uh, the stress events that will test CCPs, uh, certainly we have seen uh, major events of volatility that have significantly affected the clearing community going all the way back to the initial Brexit vote, frankly, uh, which uh, involved very large transfers uh, of immediate liquidity uh, through the clearing system. And there were anecdotal reports uh, that, I, that I think are credible that at the time, some of the leaders of the biggest financial institutions of the world were saying in response to the margin calls they were getting from clearing houses, uh, you know, the equivalent of let them eat cake. Uh, There's like, can't we give them uh, a lien on our office equipment or something? You know, do we really need to pay them? Uh, why can't they wait till the end of the week? And so it was, there was at least this anecdotal report of incomprehension uh, on the part of leaders of major clearing members of, uh, of clearing houses uh, about their exposures to the clearing house and, and, and a confusion about the immediate liquidity, the discipline liquidity requirements associated with it. Uh, so more recently, uh, September of 2019 and March of 2020, uh, the, 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 the advent of COVID certainly roiled uh, financial markets globally uh, and put severe stresses on uh, the clearing community. But for some reason that I can't explain, I don't have access to the data, uh, clearing member defaults were very few and far between. Somehow the massive amounts of liquidity that needed to be transferred through the system uh, took place without uh, much impact. Um, so, I'm not sure beyond that that I have much to say, except that that we're keenly concerned about what the situation would look like if there were uh, simultaneously such a, a volatile situation and the credit driven uh, default of a major clearing member institution. Uh, so here's a researchable problem for one of your members. Okay. One of the trades, okay, that um, drove the system to the brink, okay, was the carry trade um, in treasuries where hedge funds were taking long treasury positions and short futures positions, okay? And because the, these trade moved against them, they had to liquidate this trade. Now you're liquidating both legs, okay? What we saw was incredible dislocation in the treasury market, okay? But what happened in the futures market? You know, that was liquidated too. Both, both legs of this thing were liquidated, but it seemed like we didn't even hear about the futures. You know, we, we heard about the cash side, that is, that is to say the securities, the, the, where there was dislocation in the treasury market, the deepest, most liquid, blah, 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 in the world, okay? And, uh, and in fact, the only way that it, it got its legs under it again was because the Fed bought all the treasuries, you know? Um, everyone was selling, so the Fed was buying. You know, that's a very weird market structure. <laughs> where where you you the Fed has to has to go in and buy the best the most safe security in the world because nobody wants it everyone's dumping it you know so this is a very this this way that 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 risks move from one place to another that's a researchable thing people know about the treasury piece but no and they talk about it you know but but what happened with the futures piece and then link those things together and realize they have a common cause they have a common cause, and you need to think about that when you're regulating the system, that there are these links. There is these links that, that the futures are clearing in one place and the treasuries are clearing in another place, and, they ha and there needs to be pipes. Yeah. I just want to add one last thing here, and going back to uh, Perry's original distinction, which is not just historically important going back to the crisis, but we see this playing out right now this category error between the finance view and the money view. Uh, if you look at some of the emerging regulation that's starting to be proposed and implemented around all different types of what is annoyingly referred to as FinTech, um, a lot of it, if you talk to the people involved in it and if you look at the construction of the institutions and their business models, 
it's difficult to conceptualize what they're doing without the money. Behind. And if you look at what regulators are doing, they're trotting out the same old finance view solutions uh, in a lot of cases. They're concerned about you know, basic uh, solvency issues uh, and using basic solvency tools uh, in a way that if nothing ever changes, may seem fine. Uh, but of course, in the money view, everything's always changing. Your input is always changing. Your outputs are always changing. And if they disconnect at any point in the money view, you are going to have uh, institutional and because of all the interconnections, potentially broader systemic instability. And so this category error that, that Perry's talking about isn't just a fantastic way of understanding what really happened in 2007 to 2009, but in terms of the intellectual legacy and the failure to sort of switch over to new ways of thinking, it's also something that the footprint of, the intellectual footprint of is all over our responses to new business models. Uh, and it's gonna be a problem. Um, yeah. Then do the policy issues. Sorry, Chico? Um, I was just talking to Basel really to quicken our conversation here. <laughs> and I hope he knows now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what's the, uh, um, that's, it's been a really fantastic discussion. If we to sort of keep time for um, questions, maybe we need to sort of start moving a little more towards um, uh, uh, sort of wrap up questions. Um, and uh, before we, before we get to Q and A, definitely want to make a bit of time to, to cover, uh, um, well, uh, sort of a couple, a couple of things that be of particular interest for you know sort of researchers such as myself and the other scholars in the room. And um, uh, so, um, well, so 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 one question we would like to ask is just sort of what the um, uh, uh, what the um, uh, really what the key open policy questions um, of the of the moment are. Um, uh, and perhaps, well, let's sort of start 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 with that. And um, uh, I, I guess uh, can I put that to, to you first, um, Robert? But uh, um, that's that's to, to to all of you um, or anybody who wants to say something on it. Speak speak to it. Sure. Uh, for me, the key issue of our time, the key issue that I expect will continue to trouble us for years to come is uh, navigating this transformation of a private sector contract commitment mechanism into something that is meant uh, to be a guarantor of financial stability. Uh, I think, I personally think that the effort to make that transformation is misguided. I think we would be better suited, we would be better served by accepting the limited capacity of CCPs to provide benefits for the financial system by enhancing netting, by enhancing collateralization, by uh, assuring contract continuity, all of which can have positive uh, implications for the broader financial system. The, the effort that I fear is underway and will necessarily be consequent to the clearing mandate is the effort to fundamentally transform uh, clearing houses into outsourced uh, financial stability uh, guarantors, and kind of taking over a role that seems to me fundamentally public in nature. Uh, so that the, the the true public bodies can can deflect responsibility for uh, what they should be doing. I think that's the fundamental challenge with respect to clearing and its place in the financial system going forward. Thank you. I'd probably, uh, I would agree with uh, that last point and maybe cast it in one higher level of abstraction. So I think that the, the balance sheet of a clearinghouse under stress is really um, a microcosm of the decisions that financial stability regulators, governments have to make, right? Who pays? 
Um, who can we let live? Who, who can we let die? Uh, and how do we distribute the burdens of restructuring a network uh, amongst the network participants? Uh, and that's key, that, that, that narrow, although extremely important issue um, is being answered differently in different places. Uh, the Fed and the, the Dodd-Frank Act um, uh, approach is quite different than uh, the ECB and the Bank of England's approach in this regard. Um, but if I was to then take that to another higher level of abstraction, uh, it is the extent to which we really want to inject uh, greater automation uh, and standardization into uh, this part of the clearing structure. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, a lot of people see a lot of benefits uh, to uh, basically the digitization of the assets, the contracts, uh, and the uh, loss allocation mechanisms. Uh, but one of the things that I think all three of us, um, uh, each in our own different ways, uh, uh, has made clear is that writing the perfect contract that gives you tension when you want tension, elasticity when you want elasticity is impossible. And this means that the governance of the contracts and the institutions is something that needs to be thought very carefully about, specifically where the contract stops and you need to insert human decision-making rights to deal with complex scenarios that have you know, important ex, ex post trade-offs that you can't deal with in advance. And I think that's bound up with what uh, 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 Rob is saying here, uh, uh, in the sense that a lot of people who are pushing all of this back onto clearing houses have this vision that I can write myself a set of rules that will enable this to sort itself out. I can wrap it up in a bow and walk away from it. But one of the things that I think our frameworks all make clear is that that's not realistic and that eventually there's going to be elasticity in this system. Uh, and the only place that's guaranteed to have elasticity, whether you legislate it or not, is gonna be the central bank. Uh, and so uh, when you take all those issues together, I think the big, the big things that are come out of this are the, the application of technology, the role of the central bank uh, in uh, providing uh, liquidity, relaxing the survival constraint, uh, under uh, stress scenarios. And then what we, we sort of started with, which was the, the question of uh, who pays and how we go about determining who pays in those scenarios. Um, so that, that's all very interesting. The, um, I mean, I always learn things from the lawyers um, the, because they're much closer to the actual language of the regulation and things like that. The, um, so, let me just make uh, an observation or two about this. Yes, that's right. If, if that the lender of last resort is there to, uh, and, and just to be clear, because you're, you're speaking money view shorthand here, but for other people, why is it that the central bank can do that? The, the survival constraint, the time critical thing is about, you have to pay me now, okay? The one entity in the world that can create means of payment is in fact the central bank. And so they can accept whatever they want as collateral or not depend on collateral and, and give you a deposit account at the Fed and your problems are over, or at least the settlement constraint is kicked down the road to whatever, whatever you've promised. So that's why, that's why the central bank has that, has that power. But it, it doesn't want to be called upon all the time to do this for every Tom, Dick and Harry and every little crisis everywhere. And so it is, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to offload some of that responsibility onto the CCPs, okay? Well, so let's be sympathetic to them that we know they wanna offload it and, they, and, and let's try to think about how they could offload it, okay? What you need, okay, is a resilient dealer system, okay? Uh, that can uh, that can that can elastically absorb and expand its balance sheet and to absorb shocks of a certain size, okay, so that they never show up at the Fed at all, okay, that they that they can that because banks also have this ability to create to to expand their balance sheet on both sides and to create means of payment. It's not as good as the central bank's means of payment, but it is. So so we already have this two tier system of public and private. So there's another boundary that's always being policed, right? Is the boundary between the public and the private, okay? And the public purse and the private purse. And so 
the new form of banking, shadow banking, money market funding of, of capital market lending requires a renegotiation of that boundary. You know, we, we spent the history of banking is, 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 a, is a history of that evolving, that evolving structure that evolved into this particular system that we had that is really no longer. And now we've made banks safe as houses. That's basically what, what Dodd-Frank did. And all of the stuff that is dangerous is happening in the non-bank world, okay? But the non-bank world is actually the, where all the action is too. So that's, I, I would agree that, that, the, that, the, that the challenge, the intellectual challenge, um, which is the one that, 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 that suppose our Sweeney and I were taking in our shadow banking paper was, let's imagine a world in which there's no traditional banking, in which it's all shadow banking, okay? In which it's all market-based credit. How would we, what are the vulnerabilities of a world like that? What are, what are the backstops of a world like that? Okay, I think that is the big question. And there's lots and lots and lots of little questions in there, okay, and which we've been which we've been dealing with enough to keep every single one of you on this call, okay, busy for the next 10 years, and hopefully getting tenure and getting promoted and getting general partner in your law firm. And the, these, these are questions, and most people don't even know how to begin to think about them. So you're going to have a leg up. This was uh, a fantastic uh, panel conversation so far. So I'm, I'm tremendously uh, grateful uh, for your comments and working so seamlessly well together. In fact, next time we should think about maybe inviting someone who's a bit more contrarian and getting some spice into this conversation. Um, but um, there's one last question that we want to put out to you, but sort of um, sort of going towards the end. Before I do so, um, any, anybody on, on this call who has a question, you put it either directly uh, in the chat or put your name in there and then you can grab the mic uh, later on. We would uh, take questions in the order that they um, come up in the chat. So um, you are all very experienced uh, academics and policy advisors um, for decades, um, but having so much experience now in terms of um, you know, decades of years of experience, um, as well, we, we thought maybe a, a nice ending question would be sort of more of a life advice. Um, so what, what would you tell young um, scholars who are starting on their journey, um, more of a more um, general um, um, answer? What would you uh, give us on our way if we were to think about our future in academics or in, in the policy world? Or maybe even at large. And maybe we'll start with that. And then make Perry and Robert, you have the, the final word in that. Uh, I feel like I should start this with some sort of caveat. Uh, while my graduate students have generally been quite successful in uh, obtaining academic jobs, I'm not sure if it's because of my advice or despite it. Um, and it comes from where I come from with this, which is that be curious about how the world works. Ground yourself in the intellectual frameworks and the questions of your discipline. Uh, get to know them, get to challenge them, uh, get to know what motivates them, but be curious about how the world works and then use that as a springboard for engaging with your field. Um, because a lot of what we do uh, as I'm gonna speak uh, I mean, I've been a lawyer, I've been a, um, a, a hedge fund guy, and I'm going to leave those behind to just talk about the academic side of things. A lot about what our specific uh, uh, value to society is about is that we, believe it or not, have more time uh, and a freedom of movement uh, to be able to indulge our curiosities in ways that others don't. Uh, and while this is hard, sometimes challenging. Uh, probably uh, if you were giving a job talk at my university, I would give you different advice. But just uh, as a broad macro level uh, or a very, very broad level is to use the opportunity of your, your graduate training, any postgraduate training to really sharpen the skills necessary to uh, get to the bottom of how things operate in practice. Not to use the theory to tell you how the world works, but to use the world as it, you understand it working to help inform and illuminate your understanding uh, uh, of theory. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, read Perry. 
right? Uh, uh, what makes Perry's work so persuasive uh, is that he cuts through uh, a lot of the theory, identifies a few of the mysteries where existing theory and practice, you know, things like covered interest parity, what's the deal there? We need better ways of understanding the way that these superstructures work. Um, and then to be able to take that understanding and engage with theory and to build new theory. Uh, and that comes from a place of curiosity and wanting to understand. Uh, and, uh, you know, it sometimes gets lost in the midst of graduate training, but it's ultimately, uh, in my view, uh, what we're here for is to first enhance our own understanding uh, and then try to enhance the understanding of people around us. Perry. Um, well, that was all pretty good, Dan. The, uh, oh. I think curiosity, I think curiosity is right. You know, that um, my experience, I, I've been, I've been working at this job since 1987. So I'm, I'm older than I look. I hope I don't, I look younger than I am. Um, the, uh, and I will tell you, it's a long road. <laughs> and so you have to have something that keeps you going. You gotta be interested in it, you know? So I tried when I first started, I thought, okay, here's the kind of papers people want me to write. I'll write those papers and I'll, and I'll get tenure and then I'll be free. I wrote those papers and no one would publish them. So then I was doubly, I had, I had, I had not done something I wanted to do, okay? I'd done something instrumental and it hadn't worked. So I decided, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do the opposite now, okay? I'm gonna follow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the work I wanna do, okay? And, and, and try to find a way to survive even so, okay? So for a while I pretended to be a historian of economic thought, um, and, which I am which I am, so that wasn't uh, a pretense, but there's more to it, you know, it was, tr it was trying to reinvent and rediscover this tradition of, of the money view. Um, and I taught it for 15 years before anyone even knew I was doing it. Um, and then it turned into a MOOC. So I just wanna give the young people a notion of the amount of time, okay, that this is not about a clever hit, you know, that you get in a good journal and then you have a great life. Okay, I think it's really much more about pursuing a line of research um, for as long as it takes and chasing it down, okay? And making it yours. Um, a problem that's hard enough that it's not that easy to solve. You don't wanna solve easy problems because then what you do? You look around. Careers stop when people stop having ideas, when people stop finding things to write about. That, that is the most common way that academic careers stop. And then you move into administration or I don't know what, you know, not that those are bad things to do, but they're, 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 not, they're not intellectually moving forward. So being curious about the world um, is, is a solution for lifelong youth, okay, in this, in this, uh, in, in this business. Well, I can't improve on what uh, Dan and Perry have said so far. Uh, maybe I'll just interject uh, uh, a personal sense of how happenstance can all play a role in this. Um, yeah. It was, I think in 1987, I was asked uh, to support work by a, a partner in the law firm that I was working at at the time that, that was going to address some big high level policy questions, which I was not prepared to, to deal with as I had not studied economics. Uh, uh, I took only the, the entry level economics class, which unfortunately was scheduled at 9 a.m. on Monday mornings or something, and I hardly ever went. I, I, I seem to remember something about land labor and capital and entrepreneurial ability, but, but no, none of it ever stuck with me. And then there I was in the situation, uh, walking through the, the stacks of the law library uh, back when you really had to, to actually go out and search for books and touch them. Uh, and I saw the spine of a book, uh, the title of which was uh, The Firm, Markets and the Law. And it was a collection of seminal work uh, by Ronald Coase. Uh, and from that moment, my career path changed. Um, so just the sense of how things that at one point in your life may not seem important, you may not have invested in, you may regret that later on as I have 
so frequently. Uh, but if you pursue the path of excitement and curiosity that Dan and Perry have described, uh, wonderful things can happen. Very well. Um, thank you um, to all of you for this. Um, now, I would propose there are at least two questionnaires in the chat um, that I would not, that we would now take on. And maybe the first question goes to Carlos because you had put an earlier comment and then also a second question in the end. Do you wanna maybe just take the mic and they sort of seem to be related and pose comment slash question? Or do you want me to just read it out? So Carlos, I cannot um, hear you at the moment. So I, um, you just come in if if you can if you when you can speak. But I'm just going to re uh, start reading out uh, his comments, and um, I, uh, it's interesting. So uh, imagine a world where a currency experiences positive elasticity from increasing organic demand from users, and not increasing supply from central banks. This would be a currency whose all debts, public and private, that has managed to eliminate all forms of violence. Uh, this is a currency that users trust, not one that they are forced to use. Um, I think that the, the key part of the question, it seems to me, is sort of um, that there is uh, the question of demand and supply and, and sort of demand can sort of drive uh, the, the overall supply. And he goes on in asking, the lender of last resort feature is a moral hazard. Eliminate the central bank and will force actors to not defect and only play cooperative st stochastic games. Um, I wonder maybe if um, Perry, you are someone who could address that. Um, well, I'm, it, 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 there's not enough detail there for me to, to know what exactly this alternative currency um, is, but, but perhaps, um, it would be useful for me to uh, say, I am in general not, not starting from a normative place, okay, which actually makes me different than most of the lawyers. The lawyers sort of tend to start with a normative place. I'm starting from an empirical place, okay? I'm trying to look at the world as it is and figure out how it works, okay? And where its vulnerabilities are and where it breaks, okay? Sometimes that makes me look like I love shadow banking or something like that. Well, I, I, of course, you know, you love the things that you find fascinating in the same way that I love butterflies, you know, but I'm studying them and I'm aware that they, these are not, uh, these are flawed, like, like uh, my relatives are flawed and my colleagues are flawed <laughs> and I'm flawed, you know, and moral hazard is definitely a feature of lender of last resort. And you have private profit making agents who are trying to take advantage of that and game that system. That is definitely true. Okay. And, you know, Badgett knew that in 1873. Okay. So this is not, this is not a new revelation. He didn't call it moral hazard, but, um, and that's why he wanted to, you know, lend at a high rate, you know, um, and things like that. But and the, the reason being that when the crisis passed, people will find that it's cheaper to pay this thing back because you can get, you can get uh, cheaper money from, from other counterparties, okay? So the central bank can, that's an example of designing a backstop such that it, it, it doesn't eliminate moral hazard, but, it, but it's at least addressing that to some extent. Um, and there are versions of that that are appropriate maybe for today's world and we need to invent them. Um, I'm looking at the world as it is and, and as a historical object that's evolving in time that people are creating, individuals are creating. I'm not creating. Academics are not sitting in their, in their armchairs saying, what would an ideal monetary system be? Let me now persuade Congress to pass this act. That's not how we got the system we got. You know, it, it was invented by people who had 
practical business problems to solve, okay? And are saying, how about you and me, let's do this. And, and they're working it out. And then it gets regularized, you know, every now and then, you know, you say, well, look what we've, what we seem to be doing. Why don't we like legalize that, you know, or, or pass a law so that we, so that other people can do it too. And not just in this informal way, but that we can have an, a formal buck and then we can enforce it in, 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 in courts. Okay. Instead of just as our club. A lot of informal stuff is happening, you know, at the very apex of the system. You know, central banks are, are swapping billions and billions of dollars basically with a handshake, okay? How can they do that, okay? How can they do that? It's because they're, they're in, involved in regular interaction with each other for centuries, okay? And there's, there's a built up trust there that comes from that that those institutional connections. Um, now that can also lead to corruption and that they're helping their friends and not their enemies. And, you know, all of that's true. This is a human business. It's a human business. Um, and uh, so that's maybe a, not an answer, <laughs> but it's maybe an explanation about why I don't have an answer. Uh, what, Dan and Robert, would you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I think if I can restate Perry's point slightly, which is when I saw the question, my immediate response it was, well, over long enough time periods, this system that we do have is a response to demand. It's just that it's not pure. Uh, and uh, uh, history puts different demands on monetary systems. Politics does. Over time, we learn about what works and what doesn't. But that's not to say it's not demand driven over very long periods of time. Uh, and then the other, the only other thing I would add, I think that the central bank, if we were to talk about this in high theory terms, uh, it's not necessarily that there has to be central banks, um, but there has to be some mechanism to deal with the fact that historically, uh, money markets have been prone to different economists frame it in, in different ways, different historians as well, uh, multiple equilibrium problems. Right, So trust works until it doesn't. And when it stops working, I need somebody who can coordinate across the market uh, to be able to get us from the bad equilibrium back to the good equilibrium. So if not a central bank, sure, but we have to come up with other coordination mechanisms that are capable of achieving that light switch moment. And then the second element, which has sort of run through all of our presentations as well is that you know what, if the coordination mechanism has a solvency constraint, I've also got a bigger problem, which is that at a certain point, my coordination mechanism goes bankrupt. And so I'm also gonna want my coordination mechanism to have uh, uh, really the absence of a solvency constraint and ideally the ability as uh, the money of you would tell us to create the ultimate settlement asset. Now, whether I call that a central bank, this coordination mechanism that doesn't have a solvency constraint or I call it something else, those two features seem to be pretty important for a stable monetary system. And so if we are in the world of looking to perfect or you know, more optimal monetary systems, I think we need to focus on the fact that those two features are gonna be difficult to do without. Robert, would you wanna add anything to that? Uh, no, I, I, I think that That's covers fine. it. Okay. Um, second in line was Baron, and I and you just posted something because I think that um, Dan was sort of answering your question a little bit as well, and I was wondering whether you basically give you a chance to uh, build on that. Do you want to grab the mic? Um, or, um, so that goes out to Baron A. Um, boy, can you guys hear me? Um, this is yes. really scary. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> this is very intimate. Just feel it like uh, at home. I, I do. Everybody else does too, I think. Okay. Well, um, so yeah, um, I guess my question was in line of that decentralization process and uh, I'm trying to wade into the world of uh, you know, the crypto alliance and the crypto mechanism of solving things. Um, but I think the fact that the central bank exists, but it's also a sinkhole for 
uh, all the negative that happens in the market and the, um, you know, it, it seems to be the catch-all for uh, all the crime that's happening in terms of pollution and, and, and market escapism. Um, is, I mean, I think that is one role that we can do without, but the complete, uh, I, do, I don't know if what, what Dan just said in terms of having someone at the switch to be able to um, sort of streamline uh, agreements to keep things moving. Uh, I think that having multiple alliances and thresholds of, um, of, of, of uh, scientific uh, allowances will at least um, keep most of us from killing each other until we get to a point that we need war. That's why I just posted my last statement. So um, is, you know, I, is in Dan's opinion, the threshold always going to be a central bank or is there a different, um, um, and the central bank just is, is the brainchild of a dominant I think currency. Just the interest anyway. of time, Baron. I know. I think. Yeah. I think that that was a question in there. Um, if that's okay, um, do you wanna do you wanna leave it there and turn it to the yeah. Panel? No, I'm sorry, okay. I'm rambling, but yeah. No, mm -hmm. that was great. I, I think Dan was uh, someone who. Sure, was so the best I, I, we get kind of caught up in the name central bank, but it's worth noting that the United States doesn't have something called a central bank. Uh, and its governance isn't particularly centralized, especially in 19, you know, when it was originally created, it was quite decentralized. I think these governance choices are quite important, more important than the name that we give to the coordination mechanism, uh, certainly. Uh, and as a, you know, I would never call myself a historian, but the nature of my work is that I pay a lot of attention to the history of central banking, um, uh, Shin at the BIS has a nice paper out uh, this week on the development of the Bank of Amsterdam and how it changed over time. And that same evolution can be seen in just about any institution that fulfills this role. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be public. If you look at the role of 19th century clearinghouses in the United States and their issuance of uh, various forms of emergency currency, they had limits, uh, in particular, the solvency limit uh, that um, uh, I spoke of before, and the prospect of regulatory arbitrage outside the clearing houses, like uh, was at the heart of the 1907 crisis. Uh, but they are similar type mechanisms. And what we're doing, um, and really all of us ICR work doing this, is understanding how these institutions work, which, as Perry said, is also understanding how these institutions sometimes don't work. Um, and tracing their evolution and trying to learn lessons from them by understanding their situation and their impact within uh, the institutional and market context in which they exist. So I don't mean to say at all that we're always going to have central banks. I think that, that there's no reason to get caught up on the term. Um, uh, but I do think that uh, uh, there is use to um, acknowledging the the coordination and liquidity roles that they play and that better institutions may play in the future. Now I'm the one Perry, so, that was great. I'm gonna to have, to, to have to leave very shortly. So let me just quickly say what I call the alchemy of banking, okay, which is the ability to create means of payment by expanding your balance sheet on both sides which is true of commercial banks. It's also true of the central bank, you know, even more so, okay, is a powerful thing <laughs> and a dangerous thing in the wrong hands, okay? This is what you're pointing out to us, okay? Um, and it is a political thing. For whom do I expand my balance sheet and for whom that's elasticity and for whom do I say, no, you know, you do not have access to this. This is political, both, we've been talking about central banking and imagining that the central bank is the big bogeyman, but it's also true of private banking. And, 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 and so the political economy of banking, the political economy of central banking, okay, is I think something that you want to, us to put on the table as a question. And I think that's right. That should be a question because we're, we're nerds here, okay? You know, Dan, I say that proudly, you know, that we get really interested in, the, in this and that and you can lose sight of the big picture. And the reason that people are angry with central banks and the people, the reason are, are angry with banks 
for very good reasons, okay? And it's important to appreciate that those are legitimate reasons, you know, and that, that that's something that needs to be addressed too. The political economy of banking, who gets access to this alchemy of banking and who does not, you know, and when, you know, those are, those are serious social questions. Um, and you're putting them on the table and I thank you for it. Um, but I'm gonna have to run, is that okay? That's absolutely fine. Thank you, Perry, for, okay. for coming. I enjoyed by. this. Sorry. Thank you. Bye. We'll catch up another time. Just to, um, um, add, to follow up on Perry's point really quickly, I think that's yeah. one of the things that, and I'm hosting a series of seminars here at Cornell over the next few weeks on this, is that understanding all the stuff that we're talking about is the necessary precondition to then asking, how do I change it so that things like central banks and climate change, central banks and race, central banks and economic development are put on the table in institutionally informed ways. Uh, because those papers have yet to be written, right? Um, and in many respects, understanding the way that the institutional structures exist now around Section 13.3 lending authority, around the CARES Act authority, and why on earth some of that money is going to some of the world's worst polluters. These are design choices, and we can make better choices, but still have central banks. The existing status quo is not the only option on the menu um, for how these institutions can work and what sort of societal impact they can have. Robert. So I, I, ju I just want to throw one historical fact into the mix here. Uh, we have an interesting situation in United States history from the termination of the Second Bank of the United States in about 1837 until 1913 with the formation of the Federal Reserve System, the United States didn't have a central bank. And so we can think about that as uh, perhaps a uh, natural experiment in uh, what good and bad things happen e either in the presence or absence of things called central banks. So uh, completely agree with all the points that Dan and Perry have made. Excellent. So um, I think we're going to keep it there, um, also because we're slightly um, beyond the time that we were hoping to be in. Um, so Ferdos Malik, um, unfortunately, we won't be taking your question at the moment, but we'll make sure that uh, Perry, who is best positioned to answer that, to get that question. Um, so for all of you who are still on the, on the call, and it's everybody, um, if these topics are interesting to you, um, come join us. Um, um, both Robert, uh, but also uh, Dan and, and, and Perry, uh, people that we have interacted in the last one and a half, two years uh, on a regular basis. Uh, we have, um, when virus allows, a face-to-face -face meeting at central banks like Robert's Institution at the Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago, where we meet or have met, I think, already three or four times. Uh, we have met at the ECB uh, already twice. We had once met at the Bank of China but I'm not sure how, how that's gonna uh, go in the future, but come join us if these um, uh, meetings are interesting. If you have research proposals, um, this is an idea that uh, your research can be brought to, to this community. And there are senior people, senior scholars um, who have uh, thought about this for a long time and can maybe help you in feedback. Uh, we're also a community, means we're gonna be sticking around for the foreseeable future. So. Some of you will come and then leave again, but the institution as a sort of a, a community, uh, sort of say, um, that is to stay. And uh, whenever you feel this is a, a good time for you to come by, just do so. So uh, thank you to everybody again, Robert and Dan and, and Perry, who isn't here anymore, uh, by Asuka, um, to, um, uh, for coming by. And um, I'm gonna be stopping the recording right now. <laughs>